Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying on Wednesday the parable of the uh, prodigal son. This is part two. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 15. The, the Lord is on his way to Jerusalem to give himself a ransom for us, and he's been followed uh, by probably three kinds of people. Uh, those who were his disciples, uh, those who were just interested in what he had to say, and the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers who were uh, trying to find fault with what he had to say. And uh, he had put the scribes and the Pharisees to shame and uh, the publicans, the, the tax collectors, uh, and the sinners were crowding about him because it was a thrill, uh, would have been a thrill to them to see the scribes and the Pharisees put down. And the Lord speaks uh, a parable. Now, in this chapter, Luke chapter uh, 15, the uh, first parable uh, was a lost sheep. The sheep was lost. A uh, sheep didn't know it was lost. Uh, the sheep couldn't find itself. And the shepherd took whatever time was necessary to find the sheep, and he brought him back, and he rejoiced greatly over that. Uh, the second parable was of a lost coin. Uh, the coin didn't lose itself, couldn't possibly find itself, uh, couldn't do anything to help itself, but it was found by the one who searched for it, the one who lost it and searched for it. Uh, the first one was out in the field, uh, the sheep. The second one was inside the house. Uh, the koan. The, the third parable is called the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, I know this will get me in trouble, but it's actually a, a parable of two prodigal sons. Uh, I don't know how it ever got named the parable of the prodigal son singular, but that's what they call it. And, uh, and that's the one that we're studying. Now, this is a son who asked his father for that which was his right. Uh, he takes it, uh, he moves a long way away, and he spends it without saving. The word riotous living there in verse 13 is the negative of our Greek word sozo uh, for saved or save. Uh, his older brother accuses him of, of dealing with harlots a little bit later on in the story, but uh, at any event, he wasted his money, and so he couldn't help himself, and he glued himself, as says the Greek text, he glued himself to a citizen of that country. You'll remember that I pointed out to you clearly uh, in the parable, there are citizens of a country that are not gods. And that is in exact agreement with the Word of God. That there are sheep, uh, there are goats, there are, there's wheat, and there's tare. There's children of God and there's children of the devil. And so he joins himself to a citizen of that country, and he's seen feeding swine, lowest possible job for an Israelite. Or at least the Jews would have understood that. The swine was a, an unclean animal. He would have liked to have eaten that which he was giving to the swine, but the text 
says, our text says that no man would let him do that. And I believe I pointed out uh, that the food that's used in the far country is not suitable for God's children. The only food that you have, dearly beloved, is in the Word of God. It's, it's spiritual food. It's provided by God Almighty, and it's ministered by the Holy Spirit. And so there wasn't any nourishment for him in that far country. There isn't any nourishment for you separate from that which God provides in His Word. At verse 17, we see that he, he came to Himself. Now, how did He do that? How did a dead man become alive? How did He come, come to Himself? I'm going to suggest that he came to himself because his father had been constantly concerned about him, constantly watching over him like, like the sheep. He's been found. He didn't find himself. He didn't come to himself in the sense that, that there is something that he did to help himself. And folks, I can't insist upon that enough. Clearly behind the words is the sovereign action of the Father who had not forgotten His Son. This is what makes the parable so beautiful. He was never out of His Father's care. Not once. This Father was a wealthy man and obviously had followed His Son in the, in the depths of despair. I think it's, it's fairly clear in the parable that the Lord is teaching a, a couple of things that we really ought to take note of. First of all, all of the parables, and we've, we've looked at, at, at a few since we began this series, all of them are teaching God's people that the kingdom has been postponed. It took time to find the sheep, it took, it took time to find the coin, and it took time for the son to come to himself. And so time is an indispensable element in every parable. There's the sowing of the wheat, it took time for it to grow. There's the man that uh, prepared a great supper and uh, uh, all that were invited didn't come. And when it came time for the supper, uh, he, well, he sent out and, and looked for others and, and on and on it goes. If you look in every parable, folks, there is always the postponement of the kingdom. And the work of God Almighty, the shepherd finding the sheep, the uh, woman uh, finding the coin, the silver coin, and the father endeared to the son. So time is an indispensable element of the, the parables that he's teaching. He began teaching these parables when he, Israel was set aside in unbelief and the kingdom was postponed. He's teaching that the offered kingdom has been postponed and it'll be some time before it's established. There's our time frame uh, for these parables right here. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be some time before the kingdom is, is established. Secondly, I believe he's teaching that God is working, uh, working in the sheep, uh, working in the corn, uh, working in the sun, uh, in the unjust steward, in the raising of Lazarus, and, and so forth. All of this is teaching us that God is a sovereign God, and His working 
is behind the scenes. He is working behind the scenes. Even when it appears that he's not. Uh, whatever God has to do in your life to bring you to a knowledge of himself, of his love, of his concern, of his, of his comfort, of the hope that's yours in Christ, God will do. And it will be for your good. He knows the way that I take. And when He's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. He says that He works all things together for the good, for my good. That He's, uh, <clears throat> that he's promised that He will never leave me, never forsake me, nor will He ever cease to sustain and uphold me. He's branded my name on the palms of His hands. He lights my candle. He bottles my tears. Never am I ever, never am I ever out of the sovereign care of God. Even though I may be feeding swine. And when he came to himself, well, that's, that is an, an expression that embodies, in my opinion, all of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. God becoming incarnate in human flesh. Uh, God offering himself a ransom uh, for us. Being put to death on the cross. Buried. Uh, raised again. He came to Himself. And if you, if you know, if you take note here, I'd like for you to take note that the Son rehearses His account. I will arise and I'll go to my Father because the servants eat better with my Father than I do. You know, they're better off than I am. Uh, the, the servants in His household, they're better off than I am. I'll go and... And I'll rehearse what I ought to say. You know, uh, Father, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven. And I've sinned against Thee. I am no more worthy to be called my Father's Son. He's rehearsing this confession, folks. You know, he's recounting all of the, the terrible mess before the Lord. Is that, is that what he wants to hear? Is that what his father wants to hear? Well, you know, if we confess, homologeo, that's the, the Greek word. You know, I pointed out in previous studies how that confession it means the word homologeo means to speak the same thing that God says. Well, what did the father want the son to say? What did he want him to say? I know you love me, Father. I know I'm your son. What didn't he want him to say? Well, he didn't want him to say, well, Lord, I, you know, I, I embezzled money you know, from the bank. I stole a horse. You know, I shot this guy because I was mad at him. And on and on and on. You know, it goes down the list. Dearly beloved, what does God say? What does God say about your sin? He says it's removed as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea. He says that we're washed whiter than snow. Not white as, whiter than. That they're forgotten. Our sins are forgotten. That that they're sought for and not found. I know that you love me. That is saying the same thing. That is, that's what confession is. But the text says that he's re rehearsing his confession. No more worthy to be called thy son. And folks, we're not sons of God because we're worthy. 
Most Christians think that. It's not true. We're a son of God by birth, not by worthiness. We don't, we don't earn it. We didn't earn it. We surely don't deserve it. And that's what the older brother thought. I've served you all of these years. I don't believe in grace. That's what the older brother said. And dearly beloved, sadly, that's what most Christians say today. Christians today, they don't seem to understand the grace of God. I am not worthy to be called thy son. This boy doesn't yet understand his position in Christ. He doesn't, he doesn't understand the mind of the Father. And now we have this malnourished kid coming to his father and once again behind the scenes it must be apparent that God is working in this young man's life that he hasn't left him to his own devices that the father is the source of of empowerment he's the one that that pro he's the one that provided the the, the the stagecoach ticket, the wagon ticket, or whatever it was to, for, for this kid to get back to his father because he was in the far country. And he came to his senses. He came to his father. It took years, and I believe it takes years in everyone's life to realize that the world system, that world religious system based on human merit that I've spoken so much about, that that system, folks, has nothing to offer. There isn't one possible thing anyone could name that I would trade for the realization that I am God's son. No money, no fame, fortune, no, no possession, nothing. Nothing could equal that. That one simple statement. That I'm God's son. I wouldn't trade it for anything. There is no one ever, I don't think there's no one, there's anyone that could ever lead me to doubt that I belong to God. So he came to the Father and when he was a great way off, now, he was already forgiven. When he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Ran. And as far as I know, Folks, this is the only single passage in all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation where God was ever in a hurry. Time is not an enemy of God. Time is, is not God's enemy. But it's yours and it's mine. And all of a sudden, God the Father runs to meet him. And clearly, folks, clearly the picture is of God the Heavenly Father. Not only is He compassionate, but He runs to meet Him. I hope that you can see that the Lord is clearly highlighting how intense the rejoicing in heaven is when one of His people is found. When one of God's elect is found, you were His before the foundation of the world. He chose you in Him. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And a time came when you came to realize that there never was a time when you were a son of the devil. Never. Never was a time when you were a goat. Never was a time where you were terror. 
You've always been God's child, but you may have been out of fellowship. And the Lord wants us to realize, I believe that He wants us to realize how wonderful the rejoicing in heaven is when we are found. He suddenly realizes that God is His Father, that His home isn't in the far country. And folks, we know, we've read it, we've all read it, how that we are strangers and pilgrims here, sojourners, that this world is not our home. God is teaching us that we are strangers and pilgrims here until Jesus Christ returns. The Father runs. He ran. He fell on His neck and He kissed Him. And the kid started his confession, but he wasn't saying what the Father says. What the Father says is I love you. Your sins are forgiven. You're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in my sight. You're washed whiter than snow. Your sins are buried in the deepest sea, cast behind my back, sought for, not found, remembered no more. All of these things are true, but the son wasn't saying that. And so he's interrupted right in the middle of his little diatribe here. He got a little ways, but his father is kissing him and hugging him and, and, and just smothering him with lavishing grace and upon him and falling on his neck. And, and, and his father said to his servants, bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Folks, God never put the fact that He loves you in the past tense. God never says, I loved you. Okay? There are passages of Scripture where the love of God is seen in the past tense, but God never, ever, never uses the past tense, as, when it come, concerns you, as it concerns you. He loves you regardless of your present condition, regardless of who you are. If you are His child, He loves you. He brings forth the best robe. Obviously, folks, He's clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This boy is not back there by His merit. The Father's not recognizing Him on the basis of His own performance. His clothes were filthy rags. All of our righteousness are His filthy rags. And folks, that's a kind translation of the Hebrew word. We're new creations in Christ. We're clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't stand in our own righteousness. And that by the blood of His cross. By the blood of His cross, He's presented us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Now you can believe that, or you cannot. not. But that's what the text says. How can we help but rejoice? That's the way God sees this young man, this, his young son here. That's the way God sees him. It isn't the way others might have, might have seen him, but who cares? Who cares? If God be for us, folks, who can be against us? If He gave us His own son, clothed, clothed us with, the, with His very own righteousness, the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will lay any charge against us? Well, no one. Because it's God that justifies. Dearly beloved, wouldn't you hate to be in the position of one who says that, that, that this person over here is not righteous when God says that He's clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ?
All of the past, folks, is gone. There's no rehearsal of the past. And Christians rise up in anger when I talk about that, when I say things such as that. Well, Steve, you know, you're trying to say that, well, you know, that one can just sin with impunity. Uh, well, you know, if you call impunity feeding swine, I, you know, feeding hogs, I, fine. I, I, God has nothing against you, folks. If you're a child of God, God has nothing against you. And as, and as long as you sit around and you toy with the mess of your carnal life, that's where your mind is. If you're going to go to prayer to God and spend all of your time talking about the nitpicking, foolish, idiotic, sinful things that you did in the past, well, what are you thinking about? Well, you're thinking about those things. But if you go before God and you say, Oh Lord, I, I know. I know that you love me. I know that I'm your son. I know that by grace and grace alone that you, you've redeemed me. You've declared me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight. I know this, Father. I know these things. I know that all my sins have been Forgiven, cast as far as the east is, is from the west. Oh, Lord, how wonderful you are. That, folks, is what God wants to hear. Bring forth the best robe. But, Dad, I, I, but Dad now wait a minute. I want to tell you what I did in the far country. No. No, son, I want to hear you say, I love you, Dad. I know you love me. I know I'm completely forgiven. I know I belong to you. That, dearly beloved, is what the Father wants to hear. Now the Father puts a ring on His hand and, and He puts shoes on His feet. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the the ring is the absolute seal of his position in Christ. He belongs to God. He's sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the seal of God. It's the seal of ownership. God has placed his seal on you and me. You didn't put it on. God did that. You didn't do that. God did that. God has sealed you securely. You're his and you're, you're his alone. Your walk's been filthy. It's been in the, in the far country. It's been a walk that isn't the walk of the righteous, the righteousness of God. It's, and the shoes that God puts on are a walk in the new creation. A walk in the light of, His, of the Word of God. A walk in the Spirit. A walk in the realization that I am His Son. That there's no way that I could be anything but His Son. I'm His Son for all eternity. And my walk is directed by the Holy Spirit. And as we went through Colossians, I, I hope that some of you remember, since we walk in the Spirit, that's the verse, not if. You know, you read it, or I, it's Galatians. If you read it in Galatians, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Folks, that's a first class condition. Since you walk in the Spirit, you cannot fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This is the walk that God directs. My shoes will be the walk of the Spirit and not the walk of the flesh. There, dearly beloved, there is no merit in the walk of the Christian. And bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. 
So he's covered, he's restored, he's sealed with the certainty of his relationship to the Father. His walk is covered. Okay? And now he's supplied. Bring forth a fatted calf and kill it. The Lord Jesus Christ is trying to highlight the difference between that which is fed to swine and that which is fed to His people. Wouldn't you hate to just to live your life and, and, and die just to discover all of, all of your life was spent in error? Now He's supplied with a fatted calf. Not the, not the, whatever, the, the pig slop, the, hu the, the husk that are fed to the swine. He's fed with a fatted calf. And Christians by the thousands don't realize how wonderful, how really wonderful, and how really marvelous. Oh, Steve, it's so dry. How, how rich this book is. You know, they seem to be looking for... Well, they're seeking fulfillment in anything, everything other than Jesus Christ. But they're looking for dreams and visions and, and miracles and, and ecstatic experiences and, and who God knows what all else. You know, Not realizing that we hold in our hands the most precious thing that we could ever hold. The infinite Word of the Sovereign God. And it is great nourishment. Feasting upon the Word of God is a joyful experience. Eat and be merry. If, folks, if you don't rejoice in it, you're, you're, coming, you're coming to the Word of God with the wrong attitude. You know, it's all works. You know, there's no grace there. And folks, that's where we see the older brother. And I think that there's a little bit of both of them brothers in us. All of us. That's what I think. And we're going to close with, uh, on that, with that. And uh, I hope uh, you'll join us next Sunday as we continue on in our study in 2 Corinthians. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you all had a blessed holiday. Blessed Christmas. Uh, Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for Your Word and the opportunity that You give us to feast upon it. We're so thankful for You and for one another, for the love that You've shown us, for all that we have, all of our possessions in Christ. We just give You all the glory, honor, and the praise. Filter out that which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.